Initially, carpal tunnel injections were described as short axis approaches, but a new long axis approach was introduced, which I prefer. With this, the patient is supine or seated with the forearm supinated and palm up. The probe is placed over the distal wrist crease or transverse to the contents of the carpal tunnel. The needle will pass coming from ulnar to radial, so it's crucial that you identify and mark the location of the ulnar artery. You then slide the probe as radial as possible, so the median nerve is just under the edge of the probe where the needle will be coming from, so you don't have very far to travel. This should ensure that the needle will enter just radial to the ulnar artery and will help you avoid getting an unintended ABG from the patient. The median nerve is very superficial, so you don't have to travel too far or very deep. Be aware though for common anatomic anomalies like a bifid median nerve which you would want to inject around both portions of the median nerve. And also it's very common to see a persistent median artery which of course may impact your procedure approach and something you want to avoid if possible. In this image here, the median nerve is brought close to the side where the needle is coming from and the ulnar artery is no longer seen on the screen. In this example, the asterisk does show a patient with a persistent median artery, which you would want to avoid. So here, again, is the median nerve in the carpal tunnel, the persistent median artery, and the ulnar artery is probably somewhere around this area. So your injection is coming in above that and injecting first superficially, and similar to the biceps tendon, after about half of it is injected, you can redirect and possibly even inject beneath the median nerve. This again might free it up for many adhesions and we call that a hydrolysis. The CMC joint of the thumb is a small and sometimes difficult joint to enter when there are a large amount of joint destruction and osteophytes present. You start first by placing the patient's hand in a neutral position and place the probe so you see a long axis view of the first metacarpal bone. Then slowly slide the probe proximally until you see the first joint, which would be the C CMC joint. The needle will use a short axis approach and typically you come from a palmar direction in order to avoid injecting or piercing the first dorsal compartment contents on the dorsal side of the probe. Here you can see the target image and the needle location as it should appear in a short axis injection. Very superficial injection. In this example, it's, the target is only a half a centimeter below the surface of the skin. The hip joint is probably one of the more difficult injections you might perform. You place the patient supine with the hip in a neutral position. The probe is placed longitudinal to the femoral neck and ends up being an anatomic transverse oblique plane. The femoral neck is usually at about 30 to 45 degrees oblique from a true transverse position. If you can't find the target image, I find it easy to start over the mid thigh over the femur. There you'll see the, the femur in transverse view. You can trace the transverse femur proximally until you see the contour of the femur change, which indicates you are now at the greater trochanter level. You can keep one end of the probe anchored to the trochanter and rotate the other end of the probe towards the navel until you see the femoral neck come into view. You can then slide the probe along that angle of the femoral neck to see the femoral head and acetabulum appear. If you want, you can always identify the neurovascular structures to put your mind at ease, but you will find out quickly that these are far away from the injections that you're going to be doing. You will likely need a three and a half inch spinal needle to reach the hip joint. I find it is very helpful to remove the stylet and have the three and a half inch needle already attached to the cortisone syringe. I've tried it before and it's just too difficult to drive the needle remove the stylet, screw on the syringe with slippery gel on the gloves. That, while trying to remain sterile and hold the probe in a position, it's just better to have the syringe and the needle already attached. 
This is the ideal image you have for your hip joint injections. We see the iliopsoas running across the screen here. We see the bony hyperechoic acetabulum, as well as the hyperechoic femoral head leading to the femoral neck. Just above that is the hyperechoic line representing the joint capsule. So the, sh the injection should come at a very deep, steep trajectory and you'll want to warn the patient that as soon as you get to the joint capsule there may be a sharp pinch of pain and you want to make sure that you go through the joint capsule and not just displace it. So I try to get close to the bone and then inject. That way I know I'm in the joint capsule for sure. The greater trochanteric bursa is done similar to the blind procedure with the patient laying on their side with the symptomatic side up. The probe is then placed in an anatomic transverse plane over the greater trochanter. The target is going to be a small space just below the gluteus maximus and just above the gluteus medius. Again, despite there being a common sore spot in lots of patients, to my knowledge no one who does ultrasound has actually found fluid in this area with ultrasound. So don't expect to see a hypochoic bursa uh, in this area. In, in clinically suspicious patients you should inject and you should get the results you're hoping for. Here's an example of the procedure with the transverse IT band right here just above the gluteus maximus right in here and the gluteus medius tendon which is coming and wrapping down to attach onto the greater trochanter here. The plane we're looking to inject into is right in between these two muscles and tendons. The knee joint can be accessed by placing the patient in a supine position and the knee is resting usually on a bolster or pillow. About 20 degrees is the ideal amount of knee flexion to bring some of the fluid up into the suprapatellar recess, which is our target. You'll place the probe just above the patella in a transverse plane over the suprapatellar recess. The needle will come in from lateral to medial in a long axis approach and travel just under the quadriceps tendon and above the prefemoral fat pad. If there's no fluid seen, you can use compression or movement of the quadriceps tendon to help you identify the correct tissue plane, that's the knee joint. This is an example where you can see the needle is almost completely parallel with the probe by not entering exactly next to the probe, but actually below the probe, one or two centimeters. What this allows you to do is to keep the needle and the probe very parallel. Here you can see how the needle is coming in already one or two centimeters below the probe and nicely below the quadriceps tendon to enter the suprapatellar recess. If we have a very large patient, sometimes we can milk the fluid from the other compartments into the capsule that you're into. Also in very large patients, a large effusion can sometimes be easier to access in the lateral joint recess, and so when you're doing your pre-procedure scan, simply look for fluid, and if you see it, it's part of the joint, and you can inject or aspirate from that point whatever is the easiest way to access the joint. In this image we have the soft tissues here, the transverse quadriceps tendon detailed here, a small fusion in the suprapatellar recess is hypoechoic, beneath it is the prefemoral fat pad and we see some hyperechoic lines of the femur with posterior acoustic shadowing and the injection again is not starting at the corner of the probe but one or two centimeters below and it can easily come in very parallel and very visible. Here is an example of a knee joint injection where you can easily see the quadriceps tendon in transverse view here. Beneath it you find the anechoic joint effusion and just below that the prefemoral fat pad and the hyperechoic line of the femur here. The needle is coming in from the right towards the left and quickly injecting the cortisone and is retracted. I'd like to thank you for sitting through almost an hour of me talking. I hope I didn't bore you too much. 
I hope you also picked up on a few pointers that will help ultrasound guided procedures become easier for you, more accurate, and a more enjoyable part of your practice. I'd like to thank my mentors at the Mayo Clinic, especially Drs. Jay Smith and John Finoff, who took a lot of time to train us residents on how to use musculoskeletal ultrasound correctly. They really emphasized us learning the anatomy first and then pushing us to set the bar as high as possible.